Um, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Today I'll be talking about monitoring streaming ML systems or even just in general real-time live or ML systems that are making live predictions with feedback delays. How do we monitor these? How do we know when we have good ML performance? Um, how do we know when to retrain our model? All of these questions are pretty hard. I'm sure many of you are facing them. Um, if you have any questions at any point in time, please ask them. Um, and I think Maya will paste them in the chat here. Um, yeah, so I'll get started. Um, I'll give a brief overview, very, very brief overview on why dealing with ML pipeline sucks because I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, shift, like data shift, what that means, um, what are the types of shifts that we see and existing methods to deal with that. Um, and I'll introduce some kind of toy ML tasks that I use throughout this talk to illustrate some of the challenges. Um, and then finally, I'll conclude kind of with like, what are some interesting research problems in this area? Given these practical challenges, what are some preliminary solutions? Um, this is very, very, it's more academic um, of a talk. So I apologize uh, in advance, but I'm still excited to share it with you. So dealing with ML pipelines, like just flat out sucks, right? We all kind of have experience on the ground with this. I used to be an ML engineer before I started my PhD. And uh, the one thing that really stood out to me about my time um, as an ML engineer was that being on call debugging ML systems was the biggest nightmare imaginable, right? Like you have pretty standard like pipelines, like the one that's on this slide right here, with just a handful of components, like just ETL, splitting into train test sets, training models, splitting a calibrator, um, and having some like online kind of API to serve predictions. Um, all like this, this thing that I mentioned can have at least like 10 different components. And for each component, right, there's like a set of like at least 20 tools that you could choose. Um, so when we're kind of trying to build our ML pipelines, trying to build something sustainable, trying to build like debugging features, trying to monitor them, right? Like it's just having this heterogeneity makes it such, such a nightmare. Um, and using existing kind of observability systems for machine learning, um, or kind of end-to-end -end ML platforms was hard because we controlled part of our stack and we had issues with the other part of our stack, right? Um, and as a consequence, we had all these sorts of problems that arose after deployment of the model, right? Like imagine maybe you have corrupted data upstream. Imagine maybe your model developer is on leave and then nobody knows how like this bespoke ML works. Um, Maybe you have like training assumptions, assumptions that you made while training the model that don't hold in practice, like you're getting some data delays, um, or maybe there's some like new regulation that comes. Um, and then of course, like the dreaded data is drifting over time. And this one is the worst because nobody knows right, the difference between data drifting um, because the actual data is, the distribution of data is changing or you have some sort of engineering issue going on in your system. Um, and we have so many of these problems that could occur at any given part of the pipeline. Um, and so, I mean, observability, we all kind of know there's been several talks right in this conference on why we need observability, but I have a slide on it anyways. Um, can't catch all the bugs before they happen. Um, but once a bug happens, we want to minimize downtime, right? So in thinking of an ideal observability system or solution, we want to do two things. One, help engineers detect bugs really quickly, and then to help engineers diagnose bugs really quickly. And I'm gonna argue kind of in this talk that both of these are pretty hard to do in the ML setting um, for several reasons. And um, another thing that makes an ML observability system more interesting is that we need to kind of support a wide variety of skill sets, right? So not only is it just like engineers um, or infra people and like traditional software systems that need to interact with SRE tools, but um, now we have data scientists, ML engineers, PMs, like all um, a new, new variety of skill sets, right? To bring to the table. Um, and I think the, at least the research community um, the academic community and some people in the industry also 
Uh, we've come up with a lot of ML data management solutions to solve a lot of these problems. Um, not, not all post-deployment, but like streamlining training, building the pipeline or whatnot. So I'll categorize like the three types of academic data management solutions that I see for machine learning. Um, one around pre-training. So what do I need to do to start training the model, like building a feature store, um, ETL pipelining, all of these sorts of tools. Um, and once you kind of have that, then there's the class of data management solutions in experiment tracking. Like what's the best model for a pipeline? Um, and many of you may have used like tools like MLflow, with biases, Comet, et cetera. Um, there are also some academic tools in this space. And then finally, uh, the observability group is quite large and relatively under addressed in the academic space, which is kind of uh, real time ML performance monitoring. There's a bug in my pipeline. Where's the bug? What's the interface to interact with this kind of system? How do I visualize large scale data distribution shift instead of looking at 5,000 different histograms? A lot of these questions are super interesting to me and unanswered um, out there. So I'll talk about real time ML performance monitoring in this talk. And some slides I'll definitely skip through, um, but others I will get to. Um, so a little bit of a background here, right? What, is it, what does it even mean to do real-time ML performance monitoring? Um, and, and I'll, there's a straightforward answer to that is just, how do I know the accuracy of my machine learning model in real time? Um, and what are the blockers to kind of having this and making sure this is as high as possible? So why is this hard, right? Like one, determining your real-time performance requires labels. If we had labels at the, if we had ground truth labels every time we're making a prediction, then we wouldn't be making predictions. We would just be using the labels, um, but we don't have that, right? So if we don't have labels, how do we know our performance? Um, and then if we're also working, um, oops, if we're also working in something like recommender systems where the predictions that we're serving have some sort of feedback from the user, Right, like how do we know how good our models are? Um, so labels are not always available post deployment, and a lot of times even like they come in batch, uh, manually labeled maybe once a month, and we definitely want to know our performance more than once a month. Um, so yeah, labels are not always available post deployment. I don't know why my mouse, my cursor. Okay. Um, another thing is is your performance drops se seasonal or forever? Right. Um, so maybe like my model is not performing as well on the weekends, but that makes sense because there are fewer predictions I'm making on the weekends, or maybe I don't care as much about weekend performance. Um, but does that warrant like a total retrain of the model? We don't really know. Um, and the degenerate feedback loops, which is the recommender systems case that I just mentioned before. So all of this kind of makes uh, monitoring ML pipelines kind of hard. I see a question in the chat on heterogeneity and pipeline tools. I think I'll save that for the end uh, of this talk. Um, so going a little bit into kind of talking about kinds of data shifts. Um, so imagine you have some sort of like feature space um, or features that you're feeding into your model, and then you have your label space or the ground truth of uh, your predictions that you want to make. Um, P of X is your distribution of features. P of Y is your distribution of labels. Um, and then you have, you can think about all the kinds of conditional distributions that you have, like P of X given Y. So distribution of features given specific labels. Um, and then distribution of labels given specific features, for example, is P of Y given X. Um, and P of Y given X is what the ML model is trying to learn, right? Like given a certain uh, group of feature values, what is the label that should be attached to that? Um, so there are all kinds of shifts that people have proposed in industry and academia, like at least 10 different types of shift around like uh, subpopulation shift, like data shift, covariate shift, um, concept shift, all of these things. A lot of them mean the same thing. I distill it into a couple of things. Um, well, three things, I use chips, ML monitoring notes, if you're interested. Um, I think I have a link to that at the end of this. But one is covariate shift, which in terms of the notation, right, that's P of X is the same. So actual like label given a set of feature values is the same, but your distribution P of X changes. So I'll, I'll give an example of that shortly. Um, label shift, 
uh, this one is p of x given y is the same, but p of y changes. And then concept shift, which is p of y given x changes, um, but p of x is the same. Um, and I'll give examples of this in a couple of slides. But one thing I want to point out here is like both um, label, label shift can kind of be uh, encompassed in the other shifts due to Bayes' rule. Um, so I think the, I personally think the most things to, or the most important things to be tracking um, are covariate shift and concept shift. Um, and concept shift is kind of what really warrants the retrain immediately because your model just will not perform. Your, your entire model um, doesn't actually represent the concept anymore. So kind of when do we know when we're having concept shift? Um, okay, so, so we've kind of seen these kinds of problems out in the world. I mean, I've seen them before in my own experience. And I think there's some levels of sophistication that people have, right, when tackling these. So the straw man approach being, let me track the means and quantiles of all my features and outputs, um, and then kind of use that to uh, <laughs> determine uh, maybe like, I don't know, some P of X is changing. Maybe there's some covariate shift, I don't know. Um, and then the one level up kind of approach is I took a stats class sometime in college or I took the stats class online. And now let me track all of these like MMD, uh, KS tests, chi-squared test statistics and all of these things. Um, and maybe there's like great open source libraries to be able to do this. Um, but my, my take on this is like, yeah, that's great. You have like 5,000, if you have 5,000 features that are fed into your model, even a thousand features that are fed into your model, right? You're gonna have at least one or two test statistics per feature. And then now you have to be able to make sense of these like 2,000 different statistics that are being tracked over time. What if one is significant and one is not? Um, and furthermore, right? Like when you are working with large amounts of data and you're doing statistical tests, your p-values are just going to be small because you have like more than a thousand data points in the uh, uh, test that you're doing, right? So um, at the end of this all, right? Like both approaches are label unaware and don't use all the information we have, right? Like in practice, um, we have maybe some labels or we're labeling some data. Um, we also kind of can think about like, what was our training accuracy um, for certain subpopulations in the data and see if those subpopulations match to the inference data and then kind of estimate our um, data or estimate our performance live performance, right? So can we can we do these kinds of techniques and kind of move away from relying on this like uh, one hat, one size fits all, like tracking all of these kinds of metrics? Um, and what are the challenges in kind of doing that? So um, in talking about these challenges, I will introduce some sort of toy task to illustrate some of the challenges. Uh, let me check my chat for um, questions. How much in terms of percentage can this problem be solved with refactoring the pipelines and simplifying things? Um, okay, so I think that there, you're always going to have this feedback delay problem. You're always never, you're never going to have like perfect labels for every single prediction you make immediately on the spot. I mean, I guess maybe you will, but then my argument would be like, why would you ever make ML predictions in that case? Um, so in this case, right, like, doesn't matter how streamlined your pipeline is or whatever, it's like, what, how do you estimate your real time, like, SLIs, like, how do you meet your SLOs, right, um, and without relying on these, like, crude measures of distribution shift. Um, okay, and then what is your, what are your thoughts on incorporating testing principles? And I'll get to that afterwards. Cool. Okay, so... Uh, I have five minutes, so I'll get a teaser on kind of the challenges that I'm thinking about and writing papers on. Um, to illustrate them, I have this hypothetical binary classification task around predicting whether a passenger in a taxi ride, given the New York City taxi cab beta set, will give the driver some high tip. Actually, well, it was supposed to be high tip, but somebody that I was working with said 10%. Um, so maybe now it's a reasonable tip. I don't know. What is a high tip or reasonable tip? I'm a PhD student. Um, I use a public data set. I just use standard kind of out of the box tooling, a scikit learn, random forest classifier, and I'm evaluating accuracy. Um, and the pipeline is somewhat like I share components between training and inference. There's like a cleaning um, stage, feature generation stage, splitting into train test, training a model. There's a model store we have 
um, and the inference pipeline does the cleaning feature generation reads from the model store. Um, and the thing to note in this diagram is that feedback and inference are separate as they are in most organizations, right? You are getting your labels through another pipeline. You're making predictions through one pipeline. You need to join them somehow um, and compute to, to compute your uh, accuracy if you want to compute them in real time. Um, and here, as an illustration of how feedback delays kind of impact accuracy, um, you can see here that maybe the inference component is predicting three predictions. The feedback component gets labels for them. They come at different times. Um, so at every time step, right, you have a different computation of accuracy. Um, and my question, right, is like, can we do better than this accuracy? Do we, do we have to wait till the end for all the labels to come in? Or at t equals um, three, once I've even made the predictions, can I estimate what that accuracy will be? Um, let me skip through these to talk about the challenges. So really there are, um, I, I separate into two kind of classes of challenges here. Coarse grain monitoring around detecting the performance issues with label delays. Um, so I have three cases here, like full feedback, no feedback, and partial feedback. And then fine grain monitoring, which is once my estimated coarse grain metric, like once my estimated accuracy has gone down, um, why has it gone down? What features do I need to retrain? How do I augment my training set? Um, teasing, and this here is like kind of teasing out the engineering issues, like broken pipeline upstream from actual like data shift or constant drift, like, and so forth. Um, so in the interest of time, I will talk about the uh, no feedback case, which I think is more prevalent in industry. Um, so in the snow feedback case, right, you have no labels, but you want to know what your accuracy is. Um, a pretty standard solution is to kind of important weight training bucket accuracy. And I'll, I'll describe what that means. Um, so essentially, you have your training set. Can we create buckets in that training set with similar prediction errors? Um, or just create buckets in this training set. For each bucket, I can compute the training accuracy figure out the representation of these buckets in the inference window, and then weight them by the representation. Um, so what that kind of looks like at inference time is we already have defined our buckets for each data point we see in our live stream. We put it in the corresponding bucket. Every time we want to classify, or sorry, every time we want to compute the accuracy, we count how many data points are in each bucket, multiply that uh, representation by its training accuracy and add that all together to get whatever our estimated inference accuracy is. Um, so maybe we have in our New York example, like the buckets Spy Dive Midtown have accuracies of 80 and 50%. Um, if we see 100 Spy Dive rides and 500 Midtown rides, we can estimate kind of like a 55% accuracy by just multiplying and adding. Um, and I don't have enough time to get into this, but where this breaks, or the, the research challenge here is identifying how do you create these buckets? How do you come up with these buckets? If I come up with naive buckets like this, like uh, the location, as I mentioned before, maybe it works well immediately when I deploy the model, but as the data is drifting over time, see the right plot um, around like April, 2020, the representations change. Um, and then as a result, if I want to look at uh, how my estimated accuracy compares to my real accuracy, my real accuracy is significantly worse than my estimated accuracy. So um, to be able to employ this method means like how do we come up with like better bucketings or uh, ways to construct the subgroups. So I'm actively working on that. Um, I know we don't have enough time left. So I will just skip to the last um, section on kind of what I'm working on right now. Um, so I'm building ML trace, which is like an open source ML pipeline observability tool. Um, the idea is that for, to be bolt on kind of, can we just add it to our existing stacks that have heterogeneous sets of tools? Um, and I specifically am pretty interdisciplinary. I work on data systems, ML and HCI. Um, so projects are here. They're also on my website. I'll spare you from having to hear me regurgitate what's on here. Um, you do have a lot yeah, of no, people I, who want to have an opportunity to uh, see your slides. Ask questions. So 
Well, so to ask questions, but maybe you can, with the interest of time, you know, we'll probably choose one question to answer, but we'd love to have like your contact or maybe for people to be able to contact you on LinkedIn so that they can ask their questions that didn't get answered. And also uh, if there were some people who wanted to see your awesome slides, lots of great information. So if you look now, you can see her email. Um, so write that down and we'll also put it in the chat after. And before we go, Shreya, why don't we choose one question that you wanted to answer? There were a few that you skipped through, but I added a few more in the chat. And if you could read it out, Um, that would be best. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So what are the common tools you recommend to alert on something you are monitoring? Great question. I think um, it's super important to try to estimate your uh, ML metric as as reliably and as real time as possible. Um, so doing whatever it takes to have like a table of your joint um, labels and your predictions that you make real time, and then kind of I don't know you can make a dashboard on top of it or whatnot. Um, but in terms of like actual drift detection, if you're interested in like a lot of these distance metrics. I think Alibi Detect is a good open source tooling package. Um, it has a lot of these drift metrics out of the box, but I mean, you'll find that the challenge is in kind of like figuring out how to act on these distance metrics. Um, so what are key differences that need to be considered when monitoring ML models deployed on edge? Okay, great question. I've never worked on edge, <laughs> um, but I think the, the approach of importance weighting is can still work because you're doing your training offline separately. And you can, if you can pre compute your training buckets um, and then attach your estimated accuracy to each one, then you can kind of deploy that on edge too. Um, maybe but feel free to email me. I can talk more about it. Um, how much in terms of percentage? Oh, I already asked. I answered that. Uh, what are your thoughts on incorporating testing principles in production ML? Yeah, my thoughts are you should definitely incorporate testing. How? (laughs) I don't really know. I think this is still uh, up in the air for a lot of people. I think a big challenge is that um, traditional CI is kind of run on pull request or on code change, but ML systems change when both data changes and code changes. Um, So having like assertions in your data pipelines, having stuff that runs, um, having checks that are executing at runtime is super, super helpful. Um, But a lot of this takes like some uh, familiarity with like your business context and what do these pipelines actually mean? What does the data mean? What does that do? Um, Cool. 